voters budget which started the next fiscal year on monday so unless you tell us otherwise if for instance you're paying up a past year pledge or you want to make sure it goes to the right place the right year please write something in the remarks section so that we know otherwise we will make the assumption that it is the current year that we collected in the second announcement i wanted to make is um, we missed you all last sunday but we had uh, tasks to do outside but thank you for um, jenny and for steve for filling in for us uh, the annual budget that was discussed at the annual meeting was um, presented with a three-quarter time pastor there were certainly some concerns and hopes that we could have a full-time pastor so because there was a strong support for a full-time pastor the congregation members voted to have a second stewardship drive we needed to raise twenty seven thousand five hundred dollars to keep a full-time pastor for this coming year and the agreement was that if we reach that amount in pledges by the end of August we can then go for a full-time pastor if we did not receive those funds by that time then we would go for the three-quarter pastor so um, it's only been two weeks and I know there are a lot of questions but there are a lot of what-if scenarios that could be asked and we don't know what the answers will be because it's only two weeks into this this second part of the campaign so we ask that you wait until the end of July where we have a better understanding of where we sit financially and how much has come in before we address all the what-if scenarios it's awfully tempting I know and I know there are questions but we really don't have any other information we will say that um, Ann and I are very hopeful and we also want to thank those who have already submitted additional uh, sums to their annual pledge that's um, it's very nice very promising so in the meantime while we're waiting until the end of July we ask that you do prayerfully consider increasing your pledge thank you thanks Linda are there any other uh, announcements this morning for the good of the order not seeing any indications thereof let us prepare to uh, call one another into a time and spirit of worship dear god thank you for giving us a new day we've, we've never, never had this one before therefore may we give thanks to our creator who makes all things possible and find the inspiration we need to go forth and make, and make a, a difference, difference as people of peace love joy and hope amen please join in singing the hymn uh, number 73 in the black hymnal
During this next time of worship, we share in a passing of the peace of Jesus Christ. There are many opportunities to greet one another uh, in many cultures, their hands together and a bow, there are bumps of elbows, of fists, there are peace signs, there are hand over the heart in a gesture of reverence and praise, and uh, the God in me greets the God in you. Some people wander all over, other people's like to be tethered to one place, but let's see what happens as that amazing peace of Jesus sweeps over us and we share the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Ready, go. (laughs) Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Be with you. Peace be with you. Two minutes for our boy. Peace be with you. <laughs> Check the hockey. I love it. Hi, Jim. Peace be with you, friends. Campbell. Carol, peace be with you. Melanie, peace be with you. be with you. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ali, Ali, income free. Without there being any youngest among us here today, I was planning to go a little farther afield and involve others in the word for all ages because we do represent all ages today. If I approach you with a question and you you can <laughs> say no. But I'm going to start I'm going to start with Bev because she's now Bev, this is very tactile. I want you to feel these three pieces of wood just and what what did you find from checking those out different different textures okay let's take Bev's word for it everybody will agree that these three pieces of wood have uh, different textures to them different uh, dimensions of Texture. The and now, uh, Butch, you look like you know your way around sandpaper. Feel those four different grits. What what do you find about those? They're all quite similar. So they're somewhat similar. Who else wants to give these a try? What do you think, Donna? 
Doing it coarse. So you got a coarse. Coarse, coarse, medium, finer. Okay, so they go in order of kind of a, a coarse and getting smoother as you go. Now, knowing that about these different textures on the wood and the different grits of the sandpaper, Larry, which sandpaper do you think makes the roughest texture? So you use the red one to make the to get that coarseness. And Lynn, what do you think of what would make this one so feel how smooth that is? Which sandpaper do you think we'd use to get that real smooth? No, I can cheat. no cheating, Larry. <laughs> So a, one that's a little finer in the coarseness. So now jump with me in the le leap of faith. We've determined that these have different levels of coarseness and that the sandpapers, maybe we use a coarse grit for the coarse one and a very fine sandpaper to get this one very smooth. What I understand from reading the Bible is that the journey of faith Jesus meets each person with the level of approach that they need. Oftentimes, somebody who has had the roughest life in Scripture, Jesus approaches them with such tenderness and care and smoothness. And often those who challenge him in rough or aggressive ways, he might meet with that heavier coarseness. So our journey of faith in many ways is that movement from coarseness to smoothness with Jesus journeying with us in ways that he speaks most clearly to us. In rough places, uh, scripture says, especially during the season of Advent, God makes the rough places smooth. As Jesus journeys with us, that same transformation that we see in wood from coarseness to smoothness. Jesus journeys with us in the ways we need his presence. I think the kids would have had fun with this. And I thank you all for journeying with me. And if you have other ideas about how you see scripture moving from coarseness towards smooth and the approach of Jesus as from challenge to such acceptance and care. Let's talk about that after worship this morning. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The first uh, reading is uh, Psalm 30. Psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh, you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O oh Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O oh Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? 
Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. The Gospel reading is from Mark, um, chapter 5. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Telitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May God bless to our understanding these words of Holy Scripture. Amen. Amen. Won't you please join me in a moment of prayer before proclamation? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, O God, in thy sight, for you are our rock and redeemer. 
Amen. I recently read an interview uh, of former President Obama who was describing the many objects and trinkets and charms people at campaign stops had given to him over the years. He had multiple strings of rosary beads, all sorts of different crosses, someone's lucky metal poker chip, small statues of Buddha, and dozens of other symbolic little items that people had pressed upon him in the crowds. Obama had a bowl of these objects, he said, near his office, and he would always put some of them in a jacket pocket as he headed out for the day. And he said, I'm not that superstitious. It's not like I think necessarily I have to have them on me at all times, but it does remind me of all the different people I've met along the way and how much they've invested in me. If I feel tired or discouraged sometimes, then I can reach into my pocket and say, that's something I can overcome because someone gave me the privilege to work on these issues that affect them. I better get back to work. When I read this morning's gospel lesson from Mark, I thought about superstitions, those special items in some folks' pockets, or knocking on wood, throwing salt over your shoulder, looking for four-leaf clovers, picking up lucky pennies, not opening an umbrella indoors, avoiding walking under a ladder. What did I miss? Stepping on a crack. Oh, when we were kids, we didn't want to break our mother's back, right? <laughs> These are all superstitions that people think may bring them good fortune or avoid bad luck. What we find in the gospel reading, however, is something very different. We find a nascent belief in the power and presence of Jesus to heal and make whole that transcends superstition, magic, and fate. In the passage from Mark, we hear about two people who believe that Jesus can bring them wholeness and healing simply by that power of touch. Their faith and their desperate hopes move them to approach Jesus in two very different ways. The passage begins with Jesus once again being overwhelmed by the crowds. Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, approaches Jesus and falls at his feet, which is a posture that foreshadows the asking of a great favor. And repeatedly he says, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay hands on her that she may be made well and live and Jesus immediately walks with Jairus toward his house. And the crowd, we're told, moves along with them. But in a moment that my brother-in-law likens to the movie Heidi, suddenly interrupting the New York Jets' Oakland Raiders football game in 1968, which Oakland came from behind to win, but nobody saw it because Heidi interrupted it, so too, there is this significant interruption that delays Jesus getting to the house of Jairus. A woman who had had hemorrhaging of blood for 12 years, which made her, according to the Levitical purity code, ritually impure and thereby excluded from the social order, she believed that if she could but 
touch Jesus' clothes, she would be made well. She had spent all of her money, we're told, on ineffective treatments, and she was no better. Sick and now destitute, she moved her way through the crowd and coming up behind Jesus, touched his cloak. Immediately, Mark tells us, she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And at that same moment, Jesus was somehow aware that power had left his body and he turned toward the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? The disciples thought this was odd, saying, look at the crowd, it, it could have been anyone, it, it could have been everyone. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had touched his cloak. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down at his feet and told Jesus the whole truth. And Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. What a powerful story. What faith and power, and love, and grace. Since we don't know the woman, we could call her Heidi because of this interruption. But I'd like for us to name her Miriam, a more common first century Jewish name, and not simply refer to her as the woman with the hemorrhage. Well, that interruption by Miriam and the ensuing delay meant that while Jesus was speaking to her, some people came from the house of Jairus to let him know that his daughter had in fact died. Instead of that derailing the mission of Jesus, Jesus said to Jairus, do not fear, only believe, and they continued toward his house and according to custom of those days, there were people assigned to weep and wail and grieve the death of this little one, certainly along with her family. But when Jesus announced that she was not dead but only sleeping, these folks stopped wailing and they laughed in derision at Jesus, obviously just people of superstition. And Jesus puts them all out of the house except for the mother and the father, and taking the child by the hand, he said to her, little girl, get up. And immediately she got up and began to walk about. The writer parenthetically notes that she was 12 years old, and everyone was amazed and Jesus ordered them strictly to tell no one what have happened. And would someone please give her something to eat? There's a lot going on in this passage that piques our curiosity. Jairus is given his name. We're told his name and we're told his role, that he's a leader of the synagogue. He is of the elite. The woman has no name, except the one we've given to her today. Only her condition is described. She's seriously ill and destitute as a result. She has been exploited by others and is now labeled as impure and excluded by a strict religious order. Jairus, we're told, falls at the feet of Jesus and begs his healing presence, to which Jesus responds immediately. The woman interrupts that mission and falls before Jesus and confesses her belief. Jairus' daughter is 12, and the woman has had the hemorrhage of blood for 12 years. Jesus calls Miriam daughter, 
and he heals the daughter of Jairus. In all of these juxtapositions in the passage, it's important for us to note that despite Jesus responding first to Jairus, Jesus stops and encounters Miriam. As in most of the healing narratives, Jesus has great compassion for the poor and marginalized. And this continues that Markan emphasis on the establishment of God's realm, an order where the last shall be first, the servant becomes the leader. A second revelation is that it would have seemed scandalous in that day and age that Jesus would have touched Miriam, who was cast out and seen as impure, unclean, and yet Jesus responds to her and helps her up and says, Daughter, go, your faith has made you well. The first century folk who heard this story or who beheld it would have thought this was scandal upon scandal that Jesus would break that order and be with her. And in the same way, people, if they perceived the little girl to be dead, they would have been aghast that Jesus took her hand and called her up back to life, again breaking a taboo about touching the dead. It was scandal compounded. But Mark, using that soft sandpaper, shows to us that Jesus, who said he came to save the lost and the lone. And then a third piece for our attention. I'm indebted to the biblical scholar Ched Myers, who points out a more important foreshadowing of this passage writing, the resurrection symbolism of the raising of the little girl anticipates the death-life paradox that Jesus teaches and embodies. For indeed, upon the announcement that your daughter is dead, the narrative of Jesus' mission to the home of Jairus came to a grinding halt. But Jesus ignored that message and exhorted faith. So too will the reader, that's us, have to ignore the message of Jesus' death at the close of the narrative of the messianic mission and demonstrate our faith to continue that journey. End quote. The journey of faith for us continues as we ignore the message of Jesus' death and believe that good news that Jesus is risen. The journey continues when we pay attention to the Miriams of the world and stand in solidarity with the realm of God brought near by Jesus. The journey continues as we seek ways to use our gifts to help bring love and peace and justice and hope to this troubled world. A few years ago, I was part of a, a delegation of other conference folks that visit an elementary school in the middle of Shatila Palestinian refugee camp in Beirut, Lebanon. The children were so great. They were warm and welcoming and glad to entertain some guests. This refugee camp has been inhabited since 1948, following the creation of the State of Israel when tens of thousands of Palestinians fled their homeland. 
The people in this camp have no citizenship other than through the United Nations. They are mostly prohibited from travel and foreign travel is excluded. And they experience a very challenging, crowded and meager existence. And yet they invest in the education of their children, perhaps the fifth generation of children in this camp, that they might be, that they might be the generation to experience a real hope for their future. How is it possible that those who live in such a challenging setting can still hope for a future for the next generation? How can the journey continue when death seems too often to have the last word? Superstition won't do it. Nailing a horseshoe above the doorway cannot create the courage or the hope needed for the tasks at hand. It's about more than simply luck. How strong is that belief that if one can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment that they will be made well? A belief so strong that it transcends even death and gives us a courage to live in such a way that we somehow believe that love will win, that peace is possible, and hope will prevail. It's no simple matter in our world where terrorist attacks abound, where militaries strike with little regard for civilian casualties, where people's humanity is daily denied and debased and demeaned that hem becomes a symbol of a hope-filled and strong belief that the journey must continue. Maybe we should just keep a little piece of cloth in our pockets to remind us of that one who continues every day to call us to follow in ways of loving God, loving neighbor, including everyone. And may that somehow make all the difference in our lives and the lives of those whom we are invited to serve. Amen. The next hymn, number 337 in the Black New Century hymnal, it's a communion hymn, but it has a great message and some beautiful words for us this morning. Let us, those who are able, are invited to rise and we'll sing together. 337, draw us in the Spirit's tether.
In this time of prayers of the people, I ask if there are any with prayer requests that they'd like to share this morning for the good of the order and for our common witness. Jenny. Mine is not a prayer request. It is a major joy for someone in this community. I don't know if anybody here subscribes to the Record Enterprise, but if you have not, you should because the front page of the Record Enterprise salutes the citizen of the year named by the Plymouth Rotary Club as Larry Spencer. And I just think it is important to commemorate that as a church because he is a blessing and a joy to all of us. So, Thank you, Jenny. Larry, well done. And as our response is, uh, we raise our hands and bless Larry in his many endeavors. Uh, I'll say, oh God, in your grace and mercy, and people respond, hear your people at prayer. Oh God, in your grace and mercy. Are there other prayers that people would like to lift up this day? Yes, Eileen. I I would like uh, prayers for our our granddaughter. We've mentioned her before. It's Maddie. She's moving to um, uh, Burlington, Vermont to do graduate work. And she and her fiancé are starting out on the a journey this week to bring what they have, whatever they have, to move to Vermont and, and start a new life together. They're getting married December 21st. <laughs> For the many new journeys uh, in our midst and in our families, oh God, in your grace and mercy. Other prayer requests? Not Yes. For my sister-in-law, Judy, who's got unremitting pain uh, in her arm and neck, uh, very hard to treat what she has. And for those that are suffering from chronic pain that is, uh, saps your energy and your spirit every day, I offer a prayer to those folks as well. Mm. For Judy and all those who experience daily pain, oh God, in your grace and mercy, Yes, Fran. As you probably noticed today in our program, there'll be a service for um, in the memory of Al Mather on Chikarwa Island Chapel coming up on July 6th. And uh, Al was very active in the church for many years, and... Um, we were very grateful for his advice because he was so knowledgeable and kind and respectful to all of the members mm-hmm. of the church. For Alan Mather, O oh God, in your grace and mercy. Now, yes, Jim. Well, I hope everybody had a uh, safe Independence Day and make, have people be safe on in, this Independence Day. Yeah. Right. For all those traveling from near and far, O oh God, in your grace and mercy, let us continue in our prayers this morning. Let us join our hearts in prayer before God. Let us pray for all people, for all nations, and for the church, offering silent prayer as invited. We pray for God's church, all who serve it, for this gathering, and for all people everywhere. Let us pray for the church. Let us pray for the good earth, that all peoples may respect its resources, preserve its future, and enjoy its fruits in their season. We pray for the soil and the sea. 
Let us pray for the leaders of the nations that they may act deliberately and dispassionately and for the good of all. We pray for those who govern. Let us pray for peace, that the peoples of the world may live in safety and without fear. We pray for peace. Let us pray for the healthy, for those with possessions in abundance, that they may use their possessions to aid those in need. We pray for compassion among people. Let us pray for the sick, the sorrowing, and those who are alone, especially B, Paul and Jane, Judy, Ken, Ruth, Rebecca, Kristen, Sage. We pray for those in any need or trouble. And let us pray for the faithful departed, especially Alan Mather, Hansi Mead, Sue Swaitaj, that God give them eternal rest. We pray for those who have died. God of all living, hear the prayers of your faithful people and grant our requests. Strengthen us for the tasks you give us and bring us at last to praise you forever with your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture reminds us that to those whom much has been given, much will be required. But in this time of offering, let us give as we are able, remembering that God loves a cheerful giver. This morning's offering will now be both given and received to the glory of God and the mission of the church universal.
God, we present these offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign. With them, we offer our varied ministries in the days ahead, that each of us may be part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen. And please join us in the uh, hymn 76. And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face smile upon us and be gracious unto us. And may God lift up the light of God's presence and grant us peace this day and even forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.